some agents has actually kind of influenced how I prioritize when rankings come out of high high schoolers like they're kind of just paying attention to the top guys and tracking them as they go when it comes to the who, who's making decisions at the end of the day come draft prioritizing you know the guys that like knowing who agents are communicating with who they're tracking looking at it that way more so than like our tour of basketball reference stat queries and like Ben Rubin when he had all those benchmarks. The guys who end up negotiating these deals come draft time are paying attention to certain guys. Those to me were always the priorities. Because I like to try to find like guys that are like uh, sleepers or whatever. But at the end of the day, even though let's say I find the sleeper before anybody, but then guys will be up on him and then he'll be on those rankings that you're looking at like a few weeks later. So you're not like, you right. might be a few weeks after me or somebody who like uses bar queries or whatever, but you're still going to see the same guys at the end of the day if they're in the draft. Right. Like had I been more focused on high school scouting at the time, the Thompson twins were playing 20 minutes away Mostly, like, yes, I'd have a little bit more up close, like, viewing of them. But now everyone knows who they are and everyone knows how good they are. I'd rather spend more time being right on the guys that are kind of widely considered towards the top anyways. Wait, do you go to a lot of games in person? And how important do you find going in person? Uh, yeah, like, uh, like seeing people, like, you know. Up close, what do you think are the advantages? I think typically people will say, like, give a similar answer there, like, just like the physical tools or something. And then maybe like personal interactions, like the way a guy, uh, you know, conducts himself with teammates and stuff is like something you could see better in person. But I, you know, I always give a, the other side of it is like seeing guys on tape, you get the advantage of, you know, being able to re rewind. And so that's like a really big advantage of seeing guys on film. So, yeah, what do you think of all that? Yeah, like doing a lot of the classes and like quote unquote mini conventions over the years, like you learn directly from scouts, like, you know, the things that they prioritize and even what they do when they go see a guy in person. And like, it's all intel gathering. It's all communicating with their content, like their assistant coach contacts or head coach contacts. There's a lot of like, kind of surface level like this is how we build the entire report is get the background from showing up like two two and a half hours before the game just like watch to watch like the empty arena warm up there there is like all what i'll call just data points of personal or per, uh, personality and character background to to pick up from the way they approach warm-ups the way they like you said, interact with whether it's their coaches, their teammates, how they treat student managers. Poop Summit a few years ago, Cam Reddish, compared to some of his teammates, could not have looked more disinterested in being there. And it just really stuck out from the way that he just carried himself for those few days compared to a few of the other guys. And I'll get back to the warm ups part. Like in college, you don't you know, stray from your lane, basically. So, like, during warm-ups, you can, and shoot-arounds and stuff, you can kind of see, like, other skills guys might have that, based on their role and whatever, like, they're just kind of not allowed to showcase. Like, Lonnie Walker did a whole shooting workout where, like, he did spot-up mid-range jumpers from, like, five spots around the court. And it was just warming up, but it wasn't done with any, like, Spin as if he was coming off a pin down or taking two dribbles and pulling up. It was just spot up, like taking a pass and spotting up. And right, it, I wrote it down, asked the question, like, why is he warming up like this? Why are they having him warm up like this? I'll say the context or the scenario these guys are in, whether it's for just one year, whether it's a couple years. Remember Josh Rebell? He used to work for Draft Express. He did some stuff for them. Yeah. yeah. I remember, yeah. Uh, uh, what's it called? He went to a few uh, Wake Forest games where John Collins was there. And uh, Collins, he, he would always talk about how Collins shot so well in warm-ups. And I kind of took note of that at the time. And uh, 
because you're I don't know if you remember like Collins never shot a wake like in actual right. games but yeah just taking note of the how he always said like in warm he always shot really well and yeah I kind of put that in my evaluation a little bit I probably should have counted even more from what we saw but yeah like yeah that's an example but yeah like the Cam Reddish example um did that change your opinion of Cam Reddish at that time for sure it, it definitely and because like especially if you're like kind of in our position where you don't go to a ton of games and you don't interact a ton behind this, you're watching a ton of film. You can kind of like just tell the guys who like really give a shit. There was a premier event that these guys are going to play all season and showcase their stuff for scouts and front office guys. And it's like kind of, you appear to not be that in, interested it's like why why do you accept the invite i think i think zion was there but he was hurt so he didn't play but like that tells you something about him like he actually went for a few days and he like was involved with his teammates and so you have another guy who's actually playing who just like floats through the warm-ups like super casual to the point where it's like are you gonna like try a little bit dude you talked about like how uh, scouts collect like a ton of like background info and like intel type stuff is, is would you say you do that like do you put in a ton of uh like a big part of your scouting is like uh personal like background off-court information honestly not not really um it's probably my biggest flaw as a scout is my being way too reserved when I actually go to events and stuff like I've been fortunate enough to like travel to like McDonald's All-American Games and Hoop Summit and stuff and I'm just not the most outgoing of individuals so like striking up conversations with people I don't know has always been quite a challenge so like while it's not something I'm personally great at and I'll say good at making it a part of my process and decision making I under I've been told by enough people at this point in some of the exper in the experiences that I've had like how important that stuff is so how important is it like do you think like half the uh, evaluation should be like uh, uh like personal off-court info honestly like close to half because look at the successful organizations and what they do that makes them successful like this last five or six year run where Miami is very good at finding we'll say under scouted guys and finding something about them that they believe they're able to tap into with whether it's their X's and O scheme with SPO or their player development program there's something to the way success and Golden State has found it um san antonio these teams that have figured out like how to get guys to buy into something okay, but like a guy's desire to get better because he loves playing i i would make the assumption that that's like psychology driven personality driven and that's something that they include or even though i'm not doing a lot of that kind of work myself keeping that in mind when I'll say ranking guy. Uh, to your point, like I, I like having gained a little bit more like insight into like uh, front offices and stuff like that, or like uh, you know hearing a little bit of stuff behind the scenes. I have noticed that uh, <clears throat> a lot of the times when a guy is being really like much higher or, or lower on like mainstream uh, major media uh, big boards as relative to like draft Twitter stuff, it's usually often either like there's some like medical stuff we don't know about or some like intel off court stuff we you know, haven't really heard about. Uh, but uh, to that, uh, that almost makes a counter argument to that because Trap Twitter has been kind of more successful, I feel like, than front offices in a lot of cases. And uh, I think sometimes people like overvalue that. And I feel like what it, me and uh, Av talked about this uh, a little bit and kind of the conclusion I came just through us talking through it is I feel like, I mean, as scouts, should we really be focusing heavily on this personality stuff? Because uh, I feel like teams should have like a medical, like psychologist, uh, professionals, uh, you know, conducting that type of, of the that part of the evaluation more so, and then maybe 
combine with the scouts so that do the basketball stuff and decide uh, more. The role of a scout shouldn't be determining determining a player's like personality profile, and that there should be professional within the organization who's more suited and trained for that aspect of it. It's simply the scout's role to like gather as much intel and information data points as possible. More successful organizations would have somebody on them. Like there should be somebody there who has the ability to like ask the proper questions. Guys like us shouldn't necessarily be making, you know, the evaluation of a guy's personality. We can only gather as much information as possible. Like three uh, separate like, things. Like one is like people that scout like the basketball, like on court stuff. Two is people that are have like good, uh, like you said, like networking abilities, have outgoing personalities and could really make connections with a lot of people and really uh, get uh, good responses and honest information out of people. And then the third would be like the psychologist or like specialist that there's, so there's almost, uh, I think all three are valuable. Uh, but I, I gotta, I gotta admit, like my personal opinion, I highly doubt that any team uh, actually like holds like 50% of the evaluation is like off court right. stuff. It's hard for me to believe. There's like a tier of guys within the tier that could really uh, change things. Your point, like it, it shouldn't be maybe 50% or anything like that, but it like being a piece of the puzzle, it could be a deal breaker. In, yeah, in extreme as, situations, it could definitely yeah, be. Like, there's that, you know, for certain organizations, that's not an issue. They'll they'll handle it. And then for some organizations, like there's off court stuff where it's like, no, we're not going to deal with that. We'll just prioritize another prospect because of whatever reason X, Y, and Z is. Reason number ten on a list of like how you prioritize value in the prospect. But once you get to number ten and two guys are relatively similar in how you view them that's the deal breaker i had like one thought and then a question on that so i think part of the big issue with like discussing all this like off-court stuff all this intel stuff is like what happens is that you start conflating discipline with motivation where like if you look at someone like evan mobley right like during his senior season of high school there's a lot of questions about his motivation where like he wasn't giving that as much like defensive intensity or stuff like that or like when you look at even like Kobe Bryant, right? Like he should have a generational like intel. If obviously I, I wasn't, I would, it was even born when he went to the NBA, but retrospectively speaking, he should have like the best um, off court like intel. But what would happen is that like, if you do come, if you do conflate the motivation with discipline, you start to see like that workaholic aspect of discussing like their discipline as in the, the discipline provides the results rather than when the motivation produces the emotion. So if you do have the ability to go into like the gym and slave away and keep working on your craft over and over again, but you don't display the same level of intensity on the court, you can't conflate those two. So I think that's what happens a lot in terms of Intel where like you see like a, you start seeing motor and you start seeing they're not as motivated perhaps regardless of the context but you start using that motor and motivation and start making a general assumption on their overall like work ethic or their ability or their motivation. I think that like conflating motivation and discipline, that's like, that's like a theme I've seen over and over again. I think that looking at players retrospectively and just seeing like those little flaws, like the Mobley thing, the Kobe thing, I think that'd be really um, important. Their teams will raise questions about guys a couple of years ago, like the Matisse Tybal stuff, like because he liked vlogging and stuff. It was like it viewed as, as a huge negative that like you didn't prioritize basketball. It's like that kind of stuff to me is ridiculous because that's real like 1970s, like <laughs> let's let's do three day practices, dehydrated and see what happens. The background info is more so is this guy just kind of an asshole? Does he have people around him who you have to be concerned with? I'll say a larger portion of it isn't personality archetyping. Like, is this guy going to come into our organization and be a headache? To your point, I feel like we may not just have, like, uh, the best grasp of what, uh, like, uh, off-court intel type stuff really matters. And, like, uh, we need more studies on what indicators we should be really applying. And perhaps when we do get more information about that, then of course stuff will really turn out to be worth like close to like 50% or some like really high 
you know, uh, right. amount of the entire evaluation, but we just don't, uh, we're like in the earlier process, we're kind of like you said, behind the times, like oh, some teams are still like in the seventies or whatever. So like, yeah, one, maybe like learning more information about it and studying it more will uh, make it worth a lot more than, uh, right, it is at this stage. Yeah, like maybe part of the Spurs success for 20 years was that they understood the importance of like guys having hobbies. Like Tim Duncan was right. a comic book reading paintball playing weirdo and that was never like exactly like stamped out of him or devalued or wasn't like and you know all the weird funny stories you hear about Boris Diaw like once he went there and it's like to the extent that maybe the next phase is like teams prefer to draft guys who they can like or court guys in free agency who they could say oh you really enjoy doing this well this city's great for doing x y or z of this hobby that you like and improving their their culture and standing around the league and with players is they encourage that kind of off-court stuff like my issue with like background off-court and not that i'm like boy i guess like but like part of like my criticism on it, of it is like just like 15 years ago like our intuitive understanding of like the top indicators for prospects would look like at points per game and like you know and then like in the past decade we've seen like through analytical stuff and uh you know results and stuff we've seen that like you know steals and blocks are very important which is not something we're really thought of like 15 20 years ago when i first started looking at the draft so i i can't help but feel like there's a lot of stuff like that with uh you know off court and background information also and like you said like some people think hobbies is like a indicator of them not loving basketball but on the other hand it may be the, just the opposite that it's a very positive indicator so yeah just that they're a well-rounded person who's yeah well adjusted um if we definitely get more like uh, i guess kind of quote unquote scientific like information of uh what uh background stuff uh is really important i think uh, i would put a lot more credence towards that that me kind of like that discussion around him right like 2020 draft where they were like oh he's he doesn't have the motivation he wants to play football he wants to rap and yeah I don't know, a lot of that i think that's like the prime example of where like armchair scouts are using these like little tidbits of data or, or not data of like like news or like media like sensationalistic like bits that doesn't really have any intrinsic value but they still just make grand like grandiose like insights based off stuff that really shouldn't be making insights out of so i think like on one side of the scale obviously you do have to evaluate like maybe like the the person isn't they just simply don't have the motivation for basketball and maybe that is something that you take in consideration but on the other side like when it is something that isn't very like important and i think there is there should be a, an aspect of like trying to determine what kinds of intel is important which time what types of intel can you like truly trust versus you'd kind of like just throw away i think that's another like really important aspect of just parsing through different types of intel and figuring out which one's important which one's not a mistake quote unquote armchair scouts like that which is what i consider myself at this point we make evaluations like and being a football player first and maybe he doesn't love basketball and whatever else we make the determination not as a scout to simply have that as a piece of information we then maybe it's subconsciously and involuntary become armchair gms and presidents of basketball ops instead of the scout and say i don't want to draft this kid because in my mind i'm the gm or president of basketball ops and my decision to say no to and is because like i think this kid is going to get me fired because maybe he simply just doesn't care enough to be you know when you're drafting in the top three like and you're trying to get an all nba guy if he it, it's kind of like a weird exercise of like are you playing gm the whole time in this exercise or are you playing scout playing scout the whole time in this exercise because yeah a scout or a GM ultimately would make that decision based on like, is this guy going to get armchair scouts are doing is they're switching roles during the process and they're getting to the decider role. I have to be in tune of like, that's not how the process works in a front office. If you, if you want to play armchair GM the whole time, play armchair GM the whole time, but like 
you devaluing a guy because of that seems like why don't you take the counterpoint where it's like this kid is outgoing everyone seems to like him whenever they interact with him like he is clearly a great quote you kind of have to like go into your scouting process with a kind of clearly defined like list of steps of like why you value certain things why you value certain things more than others and then you know how much you're gonna allow allow personality driven stuff and background stuff to like influence how you bring I have to know how to scout football dude. one of the <laughs> most interesting scouting points i've ever read i forget it was a sports illustrated article like well over a decade ago nfl scouts whether it's in a game or practice, like if they see a guy do something once, know they have the ability to do it. That is like a huge thing in, in I'll say football scouting minds where it's like, we just know this guy needs to be capable of doing something. And this speaks a little bit to the original points of like going early and watching games in person. It's like to see a guy be capable of doing something is, I'll say a very intriguing data point that I kind of have cripped from that article I read however many years ago. Practices and warm-ups and, you know, whether playing for national teams in roles that they don't normally fill on their college or high school teams, like why those kind of, those contexts are super valuable. So. Even in games, like uh, when I went to like AU events, uh, uh, like I'd see all the scouts sitting there and coaches and they'll be like half asleep or talking on their phone. And then all of a sudden, one of the random like players was up for a dunk and like was like way above the rim where it looks like he has like a four inch vertical and everybody all of a sudden is like writing in their notes. Like, was this guy like, you know, just one point, but you see like that, you know, obviously not everybody's capable of, you know, that type of vertical leaping and, quickness whatever he showed in that place so called do you use like analytics and eye test about equal do you have any sort of like maybe not necessarily a strict model but kind of a statistical system you apply or do you kind of loosely just uh use it here and there or i mean i kind of i'll say i follow the pack a little bit when it comes to analytics like having like you pointed out before like learning about you know steals and blocks being important I like to the extent when it comes to stats, like I don't necessarily like, I wouldn't call that analytics necessarily because like so PIPM and BPM, I don't know how it's like formulated. So it's not that I discredit, I don't discredit it at all and I utilize it, but it's more so a quote I learned over the years and I forget who said it, but it was stats indict video convicts. Utilizing analytics to make you ask questions to go find the answers in film. In my opinion, it should make you ask the questions that you then dive into the film and try and figure out, like, either beforehand to make you start looking at a prospect or, and or, and do it again at the end of, or towards the end of the scouting process to re-examine a prospect or two prospects head to head. I prioritize the eye test, but I utilize analytics to, I'll say, sharpen my eye test and help me figure out what I'm looking for and what I need to adjust or figure out. I mean, even if you do it chronologically, like in the opposite order, like you see something first, you convict them first and then indict them, but it would still be kind of the same concept, right? Because you could like see a guy uh, shooting really well in a game and then uh, you go check out their stats and yeah, they are a great shooter. Or maybe they weren't a, the, the, the right. great, well, yeah, least, like, but, but, but it would still be kind of the same concept. Usually I'll look at a guy's numbers, even if just briefly before jumping in the video, just like get a sense of quote unquote, like what they're good at, like as a baseline, based on like basic numbers and then jump in the film. Made a habit recently of like an Evan, Evan Demir's uh, like former guest, daily, friend of the show, <laughs> friend of the show. Uh, <laughs> his newsletters that he comes out with are great, and then lucky and back to back drafts where I was. I mean, I was at the very beginning stages of wanting to like be a scout and trying to be a scout. And I was like, 
I'm not too big on Anthony Davis, but like for some stupid reason, because like of the kind of guy personality and guy I like watching, like I like Jimmy Butler in college and I like Draymond in college because Dr- I was at Indiana and Draymond kicked our ass every year. And it's like when the Heat had, I think they drafted Arnett Moultrie, Moultrie or something like that. Yeah, for Mississippi State, yeah. And I was like, Draymond's on the board. He's another Udonis Haslam. What are you doing? And so, like, I was at my beginning stages, and for some reason I thought, you know, Draymond was the next Udonis versus, you know, the next generational defensive player. But it was like, in back to back drafts, I was like, and I think they – I forget the mechanics of how they ended up with Norris Cole when Jimmy Butler was available, but it was like, in my eyes, based on these guys play hard, they play defense, they rebound, like the six seven, the six nine guys who could de- play defense, rebound, pass, and like even if they couldn't really score, that big three era really influenced how I like how I like certain guys because I was thinking of like how do you fit these guys around LeBron and Wade and Bosch so I I, since then I've always had this affinity like when I know a guy can play defense and I know a guy can dribble and pass so like when the Heat drafted Winslow I saw this comment as like the 6'7 lefty who can defend three positions he's a good passer he can dribble and play make a little bit like to me I I idealized that kind of player type for a long time and you know it led it led me to liking guys like uh jared vanderbilt bruce brown and like guys like that in that draft class but then like i over the years have missed on guys like tatum and trey and end of the day you need a number one offensive end being absolutely certain that a guy is like worth the eighth pick shouldn't supersede needing to be right on a guy like Tatum and Trey in those situations. Like, so that's where I've had to personally adjust over the years is like this, this weird archetype of a player that I fell in love with over a decade ago is like, all right, I need to grow up a little bit and like adjust. The- it means when I see the next guy like that, I still like have like this intrinsic attraction to them. And I mean, I could just like, it's hard for me to adjust, even if I know I should. And it's like, like, I don't know, like, cause either I'll over adjust and then what I just move them down a ton. Like, how do you go about uh, like actually like executing the adjustment uh, board? Yeah. Like on the board and just, yeah. In the, your evaluation, like you're watching that you think like you're watching the next, whoever Jared Vanderbilt, Justice Wenzel. And I would think you watching them, you're like, oh, this guy is really good. But then you're like, oh, wait, but he's this ar- archetype. So now I, what, how do you, you just move him down a few spots? And this kind of goes to the original point of like how, how I prioritize who I watch. And the time nor like the inclination to watch three or 400 different guys. Someone made a bar chart kind of of each draft like how many all NBA guys there were, how many all-stars, how many guys like were rotation guys to like the end of a second contract. Right. Like there's a, there's a way historically, at least over the last decade to 15 years, where like, we know in each draft that like, if, if there are more than 30 guys in a draft who like last to a second contract, like that's, kind of an anomaly yeah so it's like right like that's a super deep draft if you get like 30 guys who are in the league like beyond six years basically right like beyond the rookie deals and all that so it's like when with a guy like Vanderbilt or Bruce Brown or DeAnthony Melton back in I was good early on at identifying like these guys are first round picks those guys are valuable and you can look at championship or conference finals teams for the last 15 years and look at like role players and bench players and why they're valuable and look at what they were in college and you know who's going to hit and who's not of those kind of guys does help and like to me like 
those are finding the sleepers, the five-star guys who like actually are going to find a role in the pros that they're not the star player. They're actually like going to be a good fourth starter for a playoff team. But like in the scouting process, those guys can't take as much of a precedent or priority. It's Luca, it's Trey, it's Aiton, like, but you're not worried that you'll miss some like a star in the second round. I mean, I guess that almost never happens, but I still like feel like I gotta find like if there's a star in the second round, I better make sure I don't miss out on the guy. I always like feel FOMO. Like, once you get close enough to the draft, a lot of that is also agent maneuvering. Like guy, is it Gary Payton Jr., who like should have been drafted, want to sign where we want. Don't draft. Well, Austin Reeves did. Uh, Austin Reeves did that. Once you get close enough to the draft, and you get a better sense based on, honestly, Gavoni and other uh, outlets who like produce uh, mock drafts. Some other baseball movie where like this kind of thing happened, where like a random kid was like a motel maintenance kid and was brought in for a workout at the end of the movie and showed up the number one pick during batting practice because the kid was a pitcher. And it's like, that doesn't happen right. anymore. Like, there's just, especially in this, like, I think we're kind of in a boom period of... The information the, age. Information age. And then with all these, like, high school and all-star circuits that are popping up... It's becoming a lot more organized is really... Uh kind of consolidated, right. but like uh, really helped uh, recruiting rankings. I think recruiting rankings now compared to even like five, 10 years ago are so much better. I gotta I right. even give myself some credit for that, but mostly it's because of the sure. U leagues uh, becoming so prominent. See it as, you know, the league gets closer to adjusting to um, no more one and dones, like with some of these prep schools and high schools that are like, quote unquote, the powerhouses of high school basketball, Montverde, IMG. Um, in some of those schools, like we know, we are able to know earlier and earlier, like who's at least good enough to like be interesting in track. That draft, Gary Trent Jr., Melton, Vanderbilt, Bruce Brown were all taken in like five picks. So damn, I mean, why teams skipped over those in the back half of the first round? Like being good at that is important. I've learned paying attention to those top five, the guys who are widely considered to be top five and getting those right or as close to right as you possibly can is what makes and breaks the entire process. I feel like that kind of locks you into a mind state of where like you already have a predetermined top seven or whatever. And like, no, almost nobody could kind of crack that outside like the, you know, consensus you know, whatever well, it doesn't guys. I mean, may, maybe like the number at the top is kind of arbitrary, but I feel like, I mean, if you look at the last 10 drafts, how many of them have had like real speculation outside of the top two or three? Could be because if you do redraft, like Giannis was picked 15th and, and Gobert was like 25th, like, do, do you think we should like, uh, think about those types of, uh, you know, situations and try to get better? Or do you think that was kind of almost impossible to anticipate in the first place? So we'll never be able to like overcome that or anytime soon, at least. It's not that those examples shouldn't somewhat influence the process, but like so much of the success of guys ultimately depends on the organization that they end up with. Like Giannis's physical development after he made it into the league, like to me, like that's one of the the unknown uh, phases of scouting that, like, hopefully as we advance, we're better able to project. Like, oh, this guy's still gonna grow two plus more inches and gain seventy pounds of muscle, and it's not only gonna not hinder him at all, but it's only gonna make him <laughs> yeah. a generational star. There's certain developmental outliers that like like Kawhi like right it's like everyone's like who saw this there's certain guys that you maybe don't include in the conversation says because like they are such developmental outliers 
there's almost no way to scout for that. The way you talked though is uh, it seems like you're big on fit, and uh, me and the uh, Avinash were both are, like more best player type, uh, you know, uh, approach. So yeah, I was wondering like. What is uh, your argument for fit? Why do you think fit is so important? And why do you, do you, do you think there's situations like legitimately, I mean, you don't have to have examples, but it would be cool if you did have some examples like the, where a guy maybe you think is better than another in broad, or like as a prospect, but uh, because of fit, you know, you would take somebody else. The way you talked though, is uh, it seems like you're big on fit and uh, me and the uh, Avinash were both are like more best player type, uh, you know, uh, approach. So yeah, I was wondering like, what is uh, your argument for fit? Why do you think fit is so important? And why do you, do you, do you think there's situations like legitimately, I mean, you don't have to have examples, but it would be cool if you did have some examples like the, where a guy maybe you think is better than another in broad or like as a prospect, but uh, because of fit, you know, you would take somebody else. I wouldn't say fit as much as like being sure that a guy is going to contribute in some way. An example, I, I was way too high on Tybo because there's something about watching him where I was just like, this guy is going to be playing on a playoff team. The things he may not have been showing in college on offense, like, I think there was something, I thought there was something there and that I liked. And so I put him too high on my personal board than maybe he should have. I adjusted over the last few years to like, really view the top of the draft as best player available so it's not that I prefer fit so much as like I would call myself pretty decent at identifying guys where it's like that guy's going to be a starter or that guy is going to contribute in some form of we mentioned Ben Rubin before all the things that he wrote were like based on certain performance like all these guys on this huge list based on his work that he would do, like these guys contributed to championships. I'm not saying like I'm not best player available. It's at, at a certain point in the first round, it's like, I think I'm pretty good at saying like one way or another, this guy should be like a top 20. Is it relatively common for there to be two uh, prospects next to each other? where one that's because of the team that's picking, they should take, uh, you know, the one that's not the better prospect just because of fit. I think it, it kind of is based on the context of who is on the team and what their like quote unquote window for competing is like if, if it, for instance, and maybe I'm thinking of it too much as from the agent side of it, but like, when Miami is drafting at the back half of the lottery because like they had some injuries the year before and, you know, they finished, you know, 40 and 42 or whatever versus like 48 and 34. So like they're out of the playoffs here at the back half of the lottery, the way they draft should probably be a little bit different than like how Indiana drafts when they're decent and at the back of the lottery, because like, how free agency comes into effect in their team building like like there's a lot of like context so you think those two teams would be justified in having two different guys ranked higher almost at the same spot or i'll say any two teams like where they are in their competitive cycle right in that situation like it should influence how they draft um chicago drafted dale and terry at 18 Mm -hmm. Houston, who had the pick from Brooklyn, was in a vastly different situation in their team building. Harden, they bottomed out, like they got the pick from Brooklyn, and they took Terry Eason. In in a vacuum, I don't necessarily think I would have had those two players next to each other. This is like if you do a board, because I don't like doing mock drafts. Like I basically am just like, these are the 20 or 25 guys I like the most right. and like beyond that like whoever hits it's based on things that I can't project or control like there's something about them or the situation they get into like that's why they stick and that's why they're able to contribute like people who do tiers I think are more so have the right idea of various contextual reasons why like a group of like five guys why any one of those five can be better than the other four. 
and it kind of just ends up being the situation. So you're, basically um, you're saying it's like fit is very important, but we can't really anticipate all the those contextual things uh, prior to the draft. So we should focus more on best player available prior to the draft. But then what ends up actually happening is fit does play a large, a large role. We just don't have the a real ability to really anticipate it. A couple years ago, like I personally wanted the Heat to take Tyrese Maxey and put him next to uh, Tyler. Now, many would argue that, that doesn't really fit very well. They do a lot of similar things. Some would argue having two shot makers like that could be incredibly valuable. It's like, to me, that he was the best player available, in my opinion. Take, um, did Detroit take, they, um, I'm blanking on the kid's name from France. Yeah, Hayes. So they took, uh -huh. they had a guy, they took like a seemingly a lead ball handler guard type and then got Cade. So it's like, one would argue, you know, you're just, you've got the pick, you're taking the best player available, fit be damned, you'll figure it out later. Right. A lot of it is dependent upon, you know, I'll say organizational competence in the head coach to like, if you have two guys who do a lot of similar things and play similar roles, like what are, what's the coach's ability to make it work out? You don't know the draft order until the draft happens. So like thinking of it from a fit standpoint, you rank the 30 or 60 best players because in that order, that's who you believe like is right. going to make the most impact i would just know like from a individual team's perspective should is there like uh cases where they would choose a player even if they think maybe that player in the vacuum is a better prospect would they choose somebody over that player because that player really fits well for them How, like does that happen often I, I mean it happens sometimes i think or not even happens but like what should happen what would be the ideal uh choice uh in that situation and uh, yeah, so that I think that happens really rarely, though. It does happen once in a while when there's and more ideal choices to go for fit over best player available. But I feel like it's so rare that it almost, you know, doesn't. <laughs>
in a way. Right. Yeah, you're right. I, it's just, I guess, uh, uh, yeah. what is it called? Like semantics. Uh, like maybe there's a better way to name this group. It's just like future, like stuff that we're, this is like right now and this is future. And I was thinking about this uh, earlier and like certain things are kind of like involved, like archetype. You could have their current archetype in the way that it uh, like uh, describes okay. their current value. And then their archetype, as in like what their future will be, what uh, way we could see, uh, you know, uh, utilizing them in the future. So that's kind of right. what, there. There might be a better word than projection here, but I'm not sure what it would be. Yeah, like based on what we what you believe is the elite translatable skill, Trent Junior. There should have been something to the effect of like, kid could shoot. We knew he could shoot, even though he's a five star or high four star recruit heading into Duke. He's joining that team. The context was such like, but we knew what he was really, really good at and what was going to translate. And so like to that point, like how it kind of works to the projection of like, you know, what he is now when he was a, probably the best player on his high school team or one of the two best players on his high school team to suddenly he's like the fourth or fifth guy on that Duke team despite being a super high rated recruit and that shrinks the context of his role. And that's why going off some stats in college, certain guys were fantastic college players, like best players on national championship teams, and then are best suited to be like your third or fourth best starter, figuring out how to project those things you know, based on what their role was and then could be, I would say is a little bit further down the like process as far as like, or further down the line in the process and closer to the end of it. Yeah, I just put the boxes in random almost. I tried to make the more important ones a little bit bigger, but uh, that's interesting the way you describe yeah, it as like kind of uh, putting it in the order of like the time you first, you look at maybe production or something, and then you'll start to look at their age and then you start to gather the intel. Yeah, that'll be, that'll be interesting. Actually organizing the boxes in the order you would typically, uh, you know, uh, apply them and, uh, you know, uh, you, to get to the final evaluation. That's an interesting comment. I, I feel like it's also a good way of like, you know, speaking to, speaking to younger guys who want to get into scouting is like figuring out how to organize yourself and the process, like refining your process and the order in which you do things. Well, it maximizes your time. Figuring yes. out what it is you value, framing it in a way of what teams value, figuring out the steps in which you acquire that information and lead you to make a decision. A lot of guys have philosophies on, you know, what they like about prospects, but not many guys have the ordered process in which they are able to determine whether a guy fits into their philosophy or not and why. A lot of guys yeah. can't explain why, which is like a fundamental question and something that I keep have been told several times over the years is like, if you can't explain yourself and why you like a guy, or dislike your monthly scouting meeting and you're on a conference call and you talk about a kid, if you can't make the argument one way or another about why a kid should be, you know, placed higher or lower, like, what are you doing? That's kind of like the purpose of the podcast is trying to figure out the whys, what are the important, like the most important and the best ways to approach this in general. So what would you like, we have like question marks, right? And like little boxes, because obviously this is like an incomplete process. So like what other like factors would you incorporate into projection or whatever? Like even if the term projection doesn't encompass what you like you're envisioning it, like what specifically could also go into this projection value like framework to ultimately derive your final value? One thing that I'm sort of cursed with is I have long been diagnosed with OCD. So like my compulsion to get as granular as possible, I would begin finding value in production to such like small detail like what is it that production like what is production well, that's our first attorney. episode we kind of came to the conclusion that uh the like most 
fundamental like and basic way to describe one player being better than others a player that provides more expected points per possession to their team on the on the average uh, team within the league they're in conversation but like that's the whole like thing that i'll say old heads try to argue against when it comes to analytics is like the analytics doesn't measure the intangible like that guy set a screen like okay that stuff is like measured in one way or another though like i go by outlines more so than like i'll say charts like this my dad is in is an attorney and i've worked for several years um in the legal field and like the ability that i've gained to like know how to ask basically multiple variations of the same question or like find like if there's one point of information you're trying to find there's like 20 different questions to ask that give you the answer and all the like supporting evidence of the answer it goes back to the ordering of importance and like how you how you personally process information so like i i don't know that i'd necessarily add anything to the chart back in the day when i met uh our friend cole zwicker like Cole's influence is being able to masterfully articulate what it is that he's looking for. Absolutely, the best of that. What what PD is doing now, like your influence, like, I wouldn't say it's negative, but like people have seen what Cole did and how Cole wrote, and have tried to not copy him, but like like emulate, yeah emulate this like desire to use big words cole went to law school cole's incredibly smart and cole is arguably in my opinion the best writer word for word that there has been in whether it's nba writers college basketball like in basketball media cole in my opinion is the best writer that we've had over the last decade and Paul and uh, Ruben are my biggest influences I always say they're the big the guys that I took the most from some people might not in, include certain stuff in getting to their final evaluation or they might have like 15 more boxes so it's like if you have a method or a philosophy of like what you value my like ultimately like i can only say you better just be able to explain succinctly how you came to that decision like you could have a beautifully written 20 page breakdown on on scoot henderson wins or what have you but like at the end of the day a one page or two page thing is getting sent to the GM, he's not going to sit there and read a dissertation on guys. Like the practical aspect of uh, applying this process. It's like you have to be able to define these things in, in your own way, be able to articulate your methodology succinctly. Like I'm not like taking a shot at Cole because in written form, Cole explained everything that he felt about no, it's the, yeah it's the opposite he's the most articulate of any of us yeah. right like so yeah. don't try to be that and at the end of the right. day i guarantee you if you message him right now and you're like cole how long is your report on a given prospect not as long as the stuff he was writing for stepian if guys want to break in and they publish stuff and they put content out like let your content you know, explain how you came to the conclusion, whether it's a chart like this, whether it's outlines, whether it's podcast. And in my sure. opinion, the best way to do that is like, as if you're making a presentation to the GM, because he's the guy who's going to end up making the decision. Yeah, I mean, I thought it was an interesting response because you kind of went outside the chart and almost yeah. like went into like the meta conversation of how <laughs> the chart would uh, work in a practical situation. Right. Everyone has an approach 
all what ultimately matters is that like you're able to explore you have like intel in a box on there it's like if if you're quote unquote an armchair scout you might not be able to get a whole lot of background intel might you've done a phenomenal job over the last several years of basically having open dms and you're able to get some background intel on guys and have conversations on twitter or what have you so i'll tell you a secret if you really like search research guys online like read articles about them and like sort through forum stuff i mean think it with a grain of salt obviously if it's like just on a random forum but still like if you really research a guy like you'll get like maybe like 85 percent of what the nba has like they'll have some things like i've read like i'm being told reports they'll have like it's a guy like did some like crazy like like his uncle sold drugs or some showing that the people wouldn't publish online but most of the stuff you if you do the research really and read about them you'll be able to find in public you have done a good job of like you have conversations with kids parents right like yeah recently i've done the, I've, I've done a lot of more of that like in the past year I've, I've gotten to know a decent amount of like family members right and so but like that is part of the process but like somebody might not be in the same position or have the same level of like influence right. or not to where they can't message some kid on Twitter and at like Mikey Weisenberg front of the pod is able to get like player birthdays and wingspans better than basically anybody. Like some kids who are starting out the scouting process or early on in the scouting process like if they message a kid asking for a wingspan or something like that, and maybe that's not under the strict definition of Intel, but like, right. So their chart might just be a bit different. And so it's personal based on where they are in their, I'll say their own development process. If you feel like that's the most effective way to get to that final eval and you can defend your eval, then like, that's all that matters who, basically yeah it, like who am i to add anything to it if you feel like basically you feel the scouting process is very personalized and it should be that way that's uh that it should, like it should be very individualized do you have any like besides of course uh cole and ben if you guys go on the way back machine you could still read the steppy and stuff uh what's it called uh do you have any like books maybe you'd suggest or i don't know any video good uh, youtube stuff that could help like uh people get better at scouting and like explore their scouting philosophies and approaches and stuff like that. Uh, but real quick, was there a page below the chart about outcome? I mean, that's a whole, I don't know if you guys want to do a part two at some other date. Cause this is a whole yeah. different, this like is a whole 45 minute conversation. You know, but when we start talking about this stuff more in depth, we'll probably get you on for that. Then. Not super like they influence how I kind of like approach scouting from a meta perspective is the book range by david epstein and thinking fast and slow by daniel kahneman to, uh basketball on paper dean oliver recently pd webb's stuff is great yeah, sure. i think everybody who listens to this knows of course pd is the best writer right now and pro insight founder uh matt mckay helped influence like being succinct with reports like not being overly wordy overly long-winded like we're at the end of the day like we're talking basketball and not to say that basketball is at all simple because like we know that it's not like it's not that simple but the way you have to explain stuff to certain people if you want to work in a certain capacity for people like you have to be able to communicate uh is it hoop vision on YouTube, um, I think it's a basketball dictionary on Medium where he wrote very like good breakdowns of explaining X's and O's. Cool. Also, obviously helps to know like what the guy's role was in the scheme, and was he executing it in the scheme? Like that's where, at least on defense, a lot of stuff isn't showing up in the box score that a guy was like standing in the right place. I would encourage people to um, le learn some basic concepts of X's and O's to understand player responsibilities in within a given scheme.